I do not know how this lesson is going to come out today. I know I've done my part. I have studied and studied and studied. And all I know is God wants to do something for us today. Whether it be in this class or in the church as a whole, he always wants to do something, doesn't he? He always wants to do something. And uh, he's uh, kind of brought us back to another point from our last lesson. We're still talking about uh, aiming for God's glory. We're still in the series. In our last lesson, we focused on glorifying God in our worship. Now, Eddie, you're going to have to have Shirley take notes for you because I have so many scriptures. I'm not going to remember them when you ask me this tonight when I come in. That's because we're focused on just a bunch of different things today that centered on one focus. So, um, just quickly, so we can get our hearts and minds back to where we ended up last time. I have to do this. God shows me the lessons. I can't remember one day from the next. God's going to have to help me with that. But, uh, to remind us, um, we learned three points in glorifying God in our worship. That one, we must worship God with, with a heart of gratitude. That it is stemmed from love. That we have to worship Him from a heart of gratitude, a heart of love. We cannot begin to worship God with an ungrateful heart. And we'll go through these real, real quick. Point two, we must worship God with a heart of humility. We learned this from um, Leviticus 10. Uh, in Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu, who uh, disobeyed God and putting strange fire upon the altar. A strange fire, we don't know what it represented, but whatever it was, they was in disobedience to God in doing so. So when we come to God, we are to regard Him as holy, and by this we are to approach Him with all reverence and all humility. It says, before God, before all people, God must be glorified. And we've seen this in Leviticus 3. Um, when God said, tell Moses this, that this is that that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all people I will be glorified. He is to be honored. He is to be praised and glorified. We will worship him and him alone. So we talked about the importance of lifting our praise to God, but in doing so, Katie, it's good to see you here also, and uh, Tim, he, he's here with us today too. But we talked about the importance of lifting our praise to God. And in doing so, that means our heart has to be lifted, right? It leads us into worship. And when we get into worship, we get into a relationship with God. And is it supposed to be just centered on one day a week? No. no. It's a daily walk, isn't it? It's a daily walk. We worship God daily in prayer. In service, in our praise, we seek his word daily. It is a daily walk. If we are walking billboards to advertise Christ daily, what good does it do if our billboard is only on for a partial day of the week? Not much advertising going on, is there? We're supposed to represent Christ. So something for us to think about. Third point here, and we're going to focus a lot on this point today, which is where we ended with the lesson that God's going to create another lesson for us here and uh, I want to do good, uh, my best to mind the Lord and let the Holy Spirit just lead us where we want to go. But the third point we learned, we must worship God with a heart of total submission, total surrender to God. Last week, we our last study, we noted the sin of Nadab and Abihu. Their hearts, their minds were prepared for worship. They came to God in their own terms. They approach God in disobedience and respect, and the scriptures also strongly implied that they were intoxicated. And so that led us to ask the questions, although we're probably not coming in here intoxicated, I wouldn't think, but is our minds intoxicated? Is it consumed with life's worries? And that's where God passes that. So um, if it is, it would explain why we're not so free to worship like we want to or like we used to and uh, there's a lot of us that i feel that is being very submissive and giving thanks to god but i don't feel god would have put this lesson on our heart if we wasn't yeah. all there yeah. so um, this had me concerned this week had me in a lot of prayer this week and seeking god for what he has so the lesson for today is glorifying god in the midst of sorrow in the midst of our sorrow can we glorify God? We can, but will we? Will we glorify Him? This sorrow represents our brokenness. 
It represents our grief. It represents our pain, our suffering, our trials, our circumstances, our burdens, our afflictions. Put a name there. It's what we don't like to deal with. It's what we don't like to deal with. So this is where God has us. And as the point shows, to glorify God in our worship, we must surrender. We must surrender everything. Not just partially, but we must surrender everything. Matthew 11 says, 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He can give us the peace. Romans 12, 2, we talked about this, that we are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our what? Our mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Deuteronomy 6, 5, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So we learned all this last week, but let's stop for a minute, and I want to talk to you about where our hearts are at this week. We have a lot of burdens in this church. Some we know about, and a lot we don't know about. We have a list every day, every Sunday, every week, that we pray for. And this is just a minimal part of, of what we see and what we know. And then there's a list that several of you have that others come to you and confide in about their their things that they're going through. And that's fine. We do that. We do that for one another, right? We lift each other up in prayer. Then there's the loss that we have that sits under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit yet refuses to move towards the Holy Spirit. We have the church burned down with some very serious battles. We were singing in the choir last week. And I looked around the crowd and all I could see was very few people that seemed happy, that seemed joyful in the Lord. A lot of people were just withdrawn, sad. You could just see the countenance upon them. I'm talking about the church as a whole. We're not the only church that goes through that. This is the church today, a lot that just carry so much. By the way, we don't have to carry it. But this, and, and I'm going to depression just for a few moments, but I promise we're going to lift you up in just a few minutes. Okay, now just let me tell you where we're at. Many here are fighting cancer. Many. There's several on here. and several that you don't know about that are fighting that. COVID. The long effects of COVID. So much. I hear all the people talking uh, how much fatigue there is. How much sinuses seem to be, allergies seem to be worse since COVID hit. Uh, flu. Pneumonia. Every time I turn around, someone's got pneumonia. Heart and lung problems. Organ problems. We have a gentleman, he's not with us today, but he's in our class, that he don't know how much longer he has to live if he comes to services all the time faithfully. Autoimmune disease, broken bones, joint problems, bone problems. So that means that our doctor appointments, our medications, treatments consume our days, our weeks, our months, our year. We're just consumed. I know you're all depressed. It's depressing me writing it down. Just, just give us a moment. Then we got families burdened with grief, all kinds of grief. Grief for their lost loved ones. Grief for losing their loved ones, whether they're in heaven or didn't make it to heaven. Still grief, we still bear that, even though we have the joy of the Lord, we still have that that we deal with daily. Some that are dealing with life-altering circumstances in their family that they're not at liberty to talk about, and most of this is due because parts of their family won't turn their way over to the Lord. So their family's afflicted with sin, and it's taking a toll on the family. And not forget to add in our political, social, and racist, racial unrest that we have um, in a sinful world. It's a lot to handle, isn't it? It's a lot to take in. Is any of this that we mentioned new to God? It's not. Does he know about it all? Yes. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 1 9 says, There is nothing new under the sun. In other words, God knows, He sees all, and He's there with us, helping us. So, why? Why? And I know we know this, but this is a good reminder. So, I want us to listen, okay? Why does God allow hard times? Well, He gave us three points on this. The first two we're going to go through quite quickly. 
We know that we live in a fallen world, tainted by sin. We know that. We live in a broken world. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, talking about the day of Adam, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, be it Christ, shall many be made righteous, those who will accept him. So humanity's sin brought sin into the world. Uh, part of sin's consequence is the grief of sin. We know that if we are sinners, we have to grieve for sin. And the only way to get rid of that is what? Come to him and repent. We know that. Two, why does God allow suffering? Why does he love or allow this to happen? Because we share the suffering with Christ. Christ himself suffered. Those who suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. 1 Peter 4.16 so, our daily worship with God does not exempt us from troubles and trials. In fact, it, it kind of puts a target. Well, it doesn't kind of, it does. It puts a target on our back by the enemy. And he's aiming for that bullseye. He's aiming for us as we are Christians. Because we are bearing the name of Christ. So that automatically puts a target on our back. But it's a target that I will gladly accept to bear the name of Christ. And I know that you all agree with me. So Satan aims for that bullseye. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about how Satan sets out to buffet him, to beat him up. So that automatically puts all of us Christians in the line of fire um, against the world, against the sinful world, against our families. We struggle with our families that are lost and unsaved, that come up against us. And sadly, sometimes that happens within the church, mostly from those who are struggling in their own walk. And they point fingers, and they judge, and they even become jealous. And it causes friction. But even Christ himself was thrown out of the synagogue by his own people. That was the church, by the way. And then they threatened to throw him off the cliff. They didn't succeed. So point three, he also allows these afflictions in our life for the trying of our faith. This is where uh, we want to talk about today. We must have our faith tested to prove strong. And we've talked about this before. God gives us trials along the way. And I'm, I'm thankful. I'm not happy about going through them. But I'm thankful. I'm grateful for them. Because I wouldn't be where I'm at in my faith today if it hadn't been for all the trials. And either would you, any of you. And so, down the road, in years to come, Lord willing, we're still here, we'll have greater faith than we even do today. Because we're going to be facing some more trials. You're, you're trying to find the upside of this yet. We're coming. We're getting to it. We're getting to it. So we have two choices that we can do when we're faced with all of what we deal with on a daily basis. We can either, one, focus on a deeper faith in God, with sincere, devoted worship to enhance the joy of our salvation. Or, point two, focus on the trial, the problem, opposed to the power of God. And risk losing the joy of our salvation. So we have a choice. We have to learn to make faith choices. So we must make faith choices in our walk. We have to choose that daily. Tanya, yesterday I gave everything to God. I gave it to God. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm praising. And today I woke up finding I'm carrying it all again. What do we do, body? We fight. We fight. We fight. We fight. We're made to be fighters. Christ chose us to be fighters. So yeah, it keeps us healthy. It keeps us healthy in our, uh, our faith, doesn't it? So how do we fight? We fight by surrendering again. We keep coming to him. We keep surrendering. Our kids, our kids, and I know your kids probably do the same with you, but when they have a problem, they seek counsel with their parents. I had a script. 
scripture for that came to my mind that I don't either. And scripture tells us that we are supposed to listen. Yeah, listen to the leaders, the pastors. And if not, you'll grieve them. We, when we don't listen to the word of God that's being delivered by our leaders, our, our pastors, our preachers, teachers, we grieve them. That's why they get sick. That's that scripture. But he says, but the word says, I have to find that. I just read that the other day and I don't have it down in here. But we are not to grieve them. But it's for your benefit to mind the Lord. It's for my benefit to my Lord. Our benefit. It is. I just had this talk. Yes.
We're in a spiritual warfare with the enemy. We, that means we have to know the enemy's tactics. We have to know that he is out to destroy each and every one of us. That target is on our back. I told you that. In fact, this week, as I'm preparing for this lesson and uh, what God had for us, I was really, and still am, really burdened for our church just in so many different ways and for our leaders. And you just can feel, just like I, 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 what he said, it seems harder today than it was yesterday. It is. But nothing is new under sun. But as I was preparing for this, and maybe you've experienced this too, but as I was studying, I felt the enemy come. Where I was at so strong that I literally turned around towards my back, expecting to see something there. I mean, it was that strong. Holy Spirit reared up inside of me so strong that I started rebuking the enemy. I started fighting, Mary. And I have done this before. But I'm telling you, I was telling uh, one of my kids the other day, I said, I felt that presence in my house so strong. I felt a fight coming on. And it happened when I was studying. And when I was searching out, Lord, how, how can we help those who are sad? Who's crying? Who's mourning? Who has these burdens that won't go away? How can we help them, Lord? And as I was praying and searching, that's when the enemy came and tried to tell me all kinds of things. I got up and I started rebuking in the name of Christ. And I tell you, the Holy Spirit reared up inside of me stronger than I've ever felt him, Freddie. I felt a soldier come out. A soldier. One ready and prepared for war. That's what I felt. A fight. And I started rebuking and praying, and I'll tell you, he fleed. He fleed really quick. 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. He's chosen us to be soldiers for him. So if he's chosen us, Roger, to be a soldier, that means I have to get my armor on. I have to have that daily walk, and I have to be prepared to fight. Am I fighting the enemy? But it also means that I have to surrender it all to God. Right? I have to surrender. Yes, worse than it's ever been. But God is on our side, and he's going to help us. You were on the winning side. We are on the winning side where this is a temporary place. There's going to be a time where we don't have trials no more. So James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now this submit is a Greek military term that's used in the Bible. It's our word for surrender. So you won't find the actual word surrender in the New Testament. But submit in this form, means to surrender, to surrender to God. Surrender yourselves, therefore, to God. So it's a Greek military term that means to arrange the troops in a division in a military fashion under the command of a leader. Who's our commander in chief? God, right? That's who we're surrendering under. That's who we're going to. So our command leader is God. To resist, we have to propose a counterattack on the enemy by rebuking him in the name of what? Who? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So, yes. Yes. Yes.
He's going to help us. He hears us. He draws near to us. In fact, David, um, in this psalm I'm getting ready to read you, this little piece of scripture here, David, he was being pursued by Saul. Remember, Saul was jealous of David. So he was out to kill him. Well, on the other side, he's kind of caught in the middle because now he's surrounded also on the other side of the Philistines who also want his head, who also wants his head. So you have the Philistines and you have Saul and David is overwhelmed. And this is the prayer that he prays to God. So you know that he has anxiety and sorrow and fear and all that that comes with that. Psalms 56, 8, 11. Thou tellest my wonderings. In other words, God knows where he's at. You know where I'm at, Lord. You know the path that I'm on. You know exactly where I'm placed in between. Put thou my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry unto you, then shall my enemies turn back. Right there, David's saying, I'm putting my trust in you. If I'm crying to you, Lord, you have your heart towards me. I'm putting my heart in your hands. My enemies have to flee. So when we come to God with our sorrows and we surrender them to God, he says, I care for you that the enemy is going to have to flee. He's going to have to back away from us. He's going to have to do that. Yes, at the bottom. The enemy's at the bottom. So I cried to thee, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know. Right there. He's not wishy-washy in his faith. He's confident in his faith. He has strong faith. He's, he's sure of his faith in God. He's sure of it. For God is with me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do unto me? That's what he says. I want to talk about this collecting tears for a moment. I, I did a lot of study, and there's a lot of interesting backgrounds on, on tears in a bottle. Now, back then, they wouldn't have actually used a bottle bottle. They would have used a wineskin, which is where they uh, stored their wine. They stored their milk in these wineskins. It was whatever precious liquid they had, they stored in these wineskins to preserve them. So, archaeologists have dug up many remains of these, what they call tear bottles. They were wineskin bottles that held tears. They were, some have suggested that they were those who was mourning over the loss of a loved one. Some of these are suggested to be tears of those when, um, I read one article where it said in Bible times, the men would go out to war. And the women would pray over their men. And they would cry. And when the men would return, whether it be their husband or their son or their brother, whoever they were, when they come back, they would present to them a gift of their tears, saying, look how I cried for you. Look how much in despair I was, how much I grieved while you were gone. And it was a precious gift to give. In fact, they still, I looked up uh, the different tear bottles um, that they have today, they're really quite unique, and they give them as gifts, usually at funerals and stuff. And it's a way of giving your tears, your sorrows to God, and showing that loved one how you love one another. So when we come to God, <coughs> and he records our tears, that is saying, God cares. He loves us, and he's there to help us. He, he, he cares what we have. He cares about our pains. So, and, and David saying this, he gave all his fears, his anxieties, his afflictions, whatever they were, his sleepless nights. We've had many sleepless nights. I know I've had them. But he says, I put my trust in you because I know you care about the tears that I cry. I know that you have this. So he had confidence of faith. And what did he gain from that? Strength from the Lord. He gained strength. Because he got confident. He didn't feel weaker once he went to God. He didn't feel discouraged once he went to God. In fact, he had the joy of the Lord in him. That was his strength. Um, yes. It's 
hard for us. It is. He was saying that it's hard for us to love like Christ. And it is. We, it, we can love people, but you put that molester in front of you. Put that murderer in front of you. That rapist. And you love them like Christ? It's hard for me to do that. It is. It's something we have to pray that Jesus did. And God does, doesn't he? Yes. Yes. So we have, uh, we, when we surrender it all to God, we have, we receive strength. And that strength comes from our joy. Isaiah talks about this. Uh, Isaiah was speaking these words to the Jews in Babylon who were returning from their captivity, who had lots of sorrow, lots of, lots of tears that they cried before the Lord. And Isaiah 61 says, uh, 3 says this, To point unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of health heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. The oil of joy in the morning. When we come to God and we surrender, whether we have to surrender every day, that need, that we can get that strength, that joy, that is the Holy Spirit inside of us working in our favor. That he, am I excited that I have to go through a trial? Am I like, oh, Lord, I'm just so happy. No, it's not that. That joy means strength. That he gives you the strength to be able to take another step forward towards him in faith believing, trusting in him for our circumstances, whatever they may be. Psalms 51, 12 says, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And I feel like that's where the church is at today. I do. I feel like that's where the church is at today. I cried and I cried and I cried this week. I was burdened for our church. And I didn't have a tear bottle, Mary. But so many of you, your faces, I can't explain it. It's almost like a, a film that comes before my mind that I see when, when God does this to me. It's just faces just come before me and just how to pray for certain ones, even if I don't know. But that's how the Holy Spirit works for us. And I cried like if it was my own problem. And I prayed and I said, Lord, there's some here that need me and need my brother or sister to pray for them because they're at the end of their rope. And we need to stand in as soldiers and pray for one another. And that's something that we need to learn when we're going through things that we're to also help uplift other people. And the enemy will take our circumstances and cause us to not see others' needs. Do you know what I'm saying? So we gotta we gotta fight for one another, for the cause. That, that we may help one another, that we can be, that we can glorify God, that we can, if we're so wrapped up in our needs, I'm talking about me. If I'm so wrapped up in what my daily life holds, whatever that may be, how can I pray for the lost soul that needs to come to the altar? How can I have that burden? So we have to surrender daily to the Lord, surrender daily to Him. So, Psalms 51, restore to me the joy of thy salvation, uphold me with your free spirit. There's no bondage when we serve the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting some of your care, what's it say? Oh, ah, oh. casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. There's be uh, sober-minded, be vigilant, uh, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. That tells me that this is a temporary dwelling. May you make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. One day we will have these trials. This is just temporary.
but it's going to be worth it all when we get to heaven. That's all the Lord has for us. I pray. Pray for the services. So you can feel the Holy Spirit moving. Be obedient. If you need to come to the altar, come to the altar. If you need to surrender more to him here, surrender more to him at home, let's do it. Let's be obedient. Let's lift each one other up in prayer. And pray that the lost loved ones come to the Lord today. I love you all. Amen.